1460, the new WXBR. You are listening to the Metro South Morning Show PM in the AM. Peter Zimbor here with you on this Friday morning. Joining me right now via the telephone is one of four authors, actually five, with the man who helped put it together, of the book VJ, The Unplugged Adventures of MTV's First Wave. She is one of the original video jockeys from MTV in the early 80s. We welcome in Nina Blackwood to the program. Nina, good morning and welcome to the show. Hello, good morning. How are you? I am doing excellent. Nina, the originations of MTV fascinate me as someone who grew up when MTV was sort of celebrating the early years of the network and the success they had become, they would air a lot of documentaries here and there about your era and things they had done in preparation for the early New Year's Eve shows, the movie awards, the MTV VMAs. Your recollections of the early days of MTV, overall, positive, negative, what do you like? Oh, absolutely positive. Um... I think uh, I, I feel very fortunate to uh, have been at MTV at the time that I was, at the beginning, the ground floor, because it was uh, very cutting edge. It was, in the first couple of years, very experimental, fly by the seat of your pants type of thing. Um, and it evolved. And to be, it, it's very rare that you can be on the ground floor of something like that and grow with it. So it was an extraordinary experience. Now, you put this book together along with Mark Goodman, Alan Hunter, and Martha Quinn, all original VJs on MTV. How did it come to be that you got this job to be an MTV VJ, and when you were first offered the position or saw the job opened up, did you have any idea what a VJ was? Um, well, it's a, it is a, a long story, but I will cut to the immediate uh, time right before MTV. Um, I'd been a musician all my life since four and uh, performing and uh, had moved out to Los Angeles and along with playing my harp and, uh, you know, getting foot in, uh, uh, in the door with acting, I was also working on some pilot music video programs. This is back, you're talking 79 and 80. Um, and functioning basically as a host. It did not have the name of VJ, but that's what I was doing. Uh, one in particular with a guy that was very uh, avant-garde uh, and very much into, uh, you know, videos, which at that time, nobody was, really. So um, I was doing that, and then I, I always read Billboard magazine, and uh, came across an article about this new 24-hour music channel. Now, this uh, by this time, it's 1981, January of 81. And uh, it says they were looking for hosts and hosts, hostesses that uh, knew music, the music business. I go, well, that's what I'm doing. Sent in the 8x10 resume. They came out to L.A. a couple of times for uh, auditions. And then by June, um, they said... We want to hire you, and they I was the first one that they hired. Uh, but that entailed a move to New York, which up until that time, that was never said. <laughs> because it was satellite communications, Warner Emick satellite communications. Didn't even cross my mind that I would need to relocate. Um, but anyway, so I'm going, oh, well, I've only been in L.A. a couple of years. I don't know. Uh, so I'm trying to get to the chase, but the, the, a couple of the producers uh, – were taking me all around New York. It took me to this wonderful restaurant, Tavern on the Green, uh, to impress me so that I would like New York and say yes to the job. And um, there were some rolls on the table, and I, you know, started eating, and I proceeded to get the piece of very dry roll stuck, like seriously stuck in my throat that I was, I was, I was choking to death, N not an exaggeration. And, um, uh, uh, Robert Morton, the one of the producers, uh, had to give me Heimlich. <laughs> so, you know, after after the whole thing ca calmed down, uh, you know, he basically saved my life. And he turned to me and he says, "You owe me." And uh, right then and there, I decided to take the job. He had a one up on you when it came to negotiating, didn't he? he yeah, he did. Yeah, he saved my life. So he saved my life and he changed my life with one Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> 
Once again, we're chatting with original MTV VJ Nina Blackwood here on AM 1460, the new WXP. Now, in the early days of MTV, correct me if I'm wrong, because nowadays you'd be hard-pressed to find music videos on that channel to begin with. But back then, each VJ had a certain slot in which they would host videos throughout the day coming in and out of music videos, almost like a music-oriented radio station would nowadays, correct? Yes. Uh-huh. So very different from what we're used to watching in MTV. Now, was that all live, or was that in the can? How exactly did production go about in the it early It was 80s? basically live to tape. In other words, um, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the Tonight Show or Letterman Show. It's, you know, you very rarely would, as we'd call it, burn back. It would entail, like, some major mistake that you made. So once you were out on the set, it was just, you're going. You know, and then it would get um, sent up. Uh, to a place called Smithtown, and um, then from there, it would uh, be bounced to uh, the bird, as they would call it, the satellite. So that's how that's how we did it. MTV would ultimately have a huge influence on the careers of many major artists within the realm of music. In the early days, however, a lot of bands who were making music videos that no one had previously heard of suddenly became nationally famous due to the exposure they received on MTV. What are some of the early bands and musical artists that you remember that really got what MTV was doing and how effective this platform of music videos and cable television could be in expanding the careers of these bands? Well, the first one that always comes to mind is Duran Duran because Duran Duran actually had music out uh, prior to MTV, but radio stations around the country weren't playing it. You know, it was like, who are these guys, right? But between their style, their videogenic looks, and they did have really good songs, and then the videos being shown, you know, 24-7 on MTV, they became huge. So I think uh, Duran Duran is a prime example of artists that it was very synchronistic uh, for their career. Duran Duran, an example of a band that had music out before the formation of MTV, but perhaps became popularized as a result of MTV's existence and subsequent popularity. What are some of the older bands that had established a fan base pre-MTV that you think took the new medium in stride and really worked it to maximum effectiveness? Hmm, um, that already were... Well, I would say Van Halen. Certainly. Uh, off the top of my head. You know, Van Halen, uh, you know, they already had a following, and they, they were well-known, and uh, their videos, which were mostly performance videos, but it certainly captured uh, Diamond Dave in all his gymnastic antics. And uh, so, yeah, I think that they would be a prime example. I knew um, someone who already had a following, but he was quite reluctant to uh, make music videos was Bruce Springsteen. He really had to be convinced. He didn't like the idea of videos at first. And if you remember some of his first ones, you know, you barely, the one under the car, you didn't even see him, you know. And then he had Dancing in the Dark, of course, which was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a performance video, pretty much. But uh, he wasn't really on board the video train right off. Now, nowadays, a lot of bands vie for a prime real estate of getting a spot on MTV, whether it be their video being shown or being interviewed by somebody on that channel. What was it like when you were interviewing certain musical artists and guests back in the day? Did they understand what it was all about? Because MTV was not available as widespread, certainly as it is now, or even uh, as it would become later. In the very early days? Yes. Um, well, in the very early days, um, also the, something that should be explained because uh, a lot of people who weren't around at the time didn't realize that cable was in its infancy. Uh, MTV and cable grew up at the same time, so cable wasn't available all over the place. But I would say um, people started figuring out that it was pretty important to be on MTV about, I'd say, two years in when uh, uh, sales were kicking in. Uh, a story that comes to mind, Pat Benatar, for instance, uh, you know, she had a couple of hits before MTV, and, and she said they knew right after MTV launched, 
Um, you know, before they could just come and go in the airports, all of a sudden they're being swamped because people were seeing him on uh, MTV or, um, you know, record labels were figuring out when, like, somebody in Des Moines, Iowa was going in and asking for Culture Club or whatever, and they're going, like, who? They were seeing it on MTV. So, you know, stuff that wouldn't have been played on the radio was being played on MTV and going into, uh, you know, kind of like a web, pardon pardon the usage of that word, but into these areas uh, and growing by leaps and bounds. So, you know, it didn't take long for record companies to figure out you got to have a video if you want uh, if you want this kind of national exposure. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier on that a lot of early MTV programming was produced live to tape, a la David Letterman or Jay Leno, any of the late night talk shows. What was it like ultimately when MTV went from being live to tape to doing what I think has been a hallmark of its programming since its inception nearly, which is the various big events they would do throughout the year, the VMAs, the annual New Year's Eve show, even the MTV Movie Awards, which would come about a little later on? <clears throat> Um, well, I always loved the uh, the live broadcast, uh, especially New Year's, which they don't even do live anymore. Um, which is unfortunate. You know, it was great because what, you know, how cool to be in New York, which, uh, although I love Boston, don't get me wrong, but New York is really an amazing place to be on New Year's Eve. We're just a few steps away from Times Square, and we've got great bands, uh, designers, are giving us clothes to wear on the air, and we're celebrating all five time zones live. And, you know, it's hard to beat that kind of excitement. You know, it's really pretty cool. I was talking to my mom about the early days of MTV once she knew that I would be interviewing you, and she said that the earliest days of MTV that she remembers was John Cougar Mellencamp on a stool playing guitar. And I hear that you have had some interesting encounters with Mr. Mellencamp over the years. Particularly in those uh, days. Yeah, well, it, it is in the book, and it's kind of a, a long story, but... Um, Give the Cliff Notes version, then they'll buy it. How's that? Uh, uh, well, John, well, uh, first I, I, I have to preface everything by saying I am so proud of John. I think he has become the artist that he wanted to become, and uh, above and beyond, I, I, I'm really... Um, I like him as a person, and I'm also you know, a fan of his music. Uh, very, very proud of him. Uh, when he first came to the studio, and this is in our original studio, so I think it was, yeah, it was 81. It was right after we started, actually. Uh, he was still known as John Cougar. And, uh, you know, he's a swaggering little guy. And he proceeded to pick me up, uh, literally physically pick me up, you know, sweep me off my feet uh, at our little, uh, you know, uh, bagel table we had set up with a coffee and everything. And then he invited me to a party later that night. So I, I had to go see a band at the... It's such a long story, but long story short, the party was not a party. <laughs> it was just John and me, but uh, nothing happened because I got out of there um, relatively... Uh, quickly and unscathed, but uh, he had some ulterior motives. Um, John about Cougar. This John Cougar was trying to get some. Party. Yeah, John Cougar what? was trying to. John Cougar was trying to get some, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, and it did. It, it did not happen. And you know, I really believed. I thought it was a party until I got there, and it was just him, um, his manager, and um, a friend of his from Bloomington. Uh, Bloomington Indiana, and the manager was giving me a tour of this uh, beautiful uh, apartment that um, was on uh, Central Park West in New York, and, and, you know, giving me a tour and then getting to the master bedroom and saying, well, this is where you and John are staying. And I'm going, what? <laughs> and luckily, the person that I brought along with me, um, it wasn't intentional, but he got into a major, major argument with John about politics and religion, really uh, aggravated John, plus the fact he was seeing that his plan wasn't going to work. And uh, so a couple of years later, I was interviewing him. I had to do an on-the-road thing with him on um, going to Indiana for Entertainment Tonight, actually. And all these years later, we're sitting in the tour bus, rolling down the highway, and he looks at me with that 
a mouth. He has a very distinctive uh, mouth. And he goes, yeah. Oh, I don't know if I could say this on the air. but Oh, just go for he it. Goes, what? Just go for it. Just let it out. Yeah, he goes, he goes, yeah, who was that asshole that you brought with you? And I go, I said, I barely knew the guy. I said, it was a friend of mine's ex-husband, you know. And he goes, yeah, boy, what a jerk, you know. And it was very funny. It was very funny. So, um, yeah, he remembered that years later and brought it up. But uh, he's he's great. I mean, farm aid, the whole thing. Uh, a perfect example of somebody really sticking to their guns and doing their career the way they wanted to do it. Once again, we're chatting with original MTV VJ Nina Blackwood here on AM 1460, the new WXPR. Do you know how many guys I told who were between the ages of in their mid-40s to mid-50s that I was interviewing you today over the past day? Who Their first reaction was, oh, my God, she's so hot. When did you realize <laughs> that you had all these admirers and followers and MTV was actually becoming a cultural phenomenon? You you were asking what? what what can you say the question again? How did you feel and how did you find out that MTV was really catching on and that you had uh, admirers um, and followers? <clears throat> well, um, well, first off, I guess it started with the fan mail. Uh, we all had every intention of answering each and every piece of fan mail ourselves personally and then didn't last too long all of a sudden all this mail is coming in so interns had to do it and send out the photos and we weren't initially in New York where the studios were uh, MTV wasn't in New York when we first started so on a daily basis we didn't know what was going on but when they would send us out on these personal appearances uh, one of the first that I remember like going like, oh, my God, was in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and, uh, you know, they're driving me to this mall for for a signing, you know, autograph session, whatever. And there are people wrapped around the mall, like hundreds of people. And I say to the, the uh, driver, I go, well, who's here? And he says, you are. <laughs> and it was like, ah, drive around a little more. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. And from there... When we finally did get into New York, it was great because, uh, uh, I mean, I would literally have firemen would be driving by going, hey, Nina, how's it going? And one time was uh, flagging a cab and some cops stopped. And I go, oh, God, what, do they think I'm a hooker or something? You know, and they go, hey, Nina, where are you going? We'll give you a lift. You know, so it, it was fun. It so, was great. So you essentially, along with your colleagues as MTV VJs, were becoming just as popular, if not more popular, than some of the artists who you covered? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I can't say more popular, but, you know, people were definitely aware of us, yeah. At what point did the original wave of MTV VJs sort of peter out and be no more at MTV? How did you guys all leave MTV, and how'd, how'd that go? Um, well, for me, I, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for the others, Um but for me, I, I was getting a lot of offers uh, while I was MTV for different kinds of programs, shows, hosting stuff, uh, commercials. And we were under an exclusive contract. So much to the dismay of my manager and my agent back in L.A., we would have to turn almost every single thing down. And they were getting very frustrated and they were concerned you know, that if I didn't leave, you know, I'm going to be typecast. But I wasn't ready to leave. You know, I was really liking my job. But around, um, you know, four years into it, um, I got an offer uh, to do a couple of shows, and I almost jumped ship, and I wasn't ready. It was like leaving a family and leaving this really cool job. But then the fifth year rolled around, and these offers came back again, plus uh, they anteed up more. And by that time, uh, things you could feel a change in the air at MTV. They were hiring like somebody that was ahead of the news department. Well, the, the VJs did the news before. We didn't need a news department. You know, and, and there was no um, upward mobility there. They didn't want any of us to produce shows or to have like our own shows other than our shifts. So there was no, I mean, there was no growth. And with that happening, and then with these offers that I was getting 
um, you know, out west, uh, Entertainment Tonight, Solid Gold, um, a syndicated radio show, CNN, actually, had offered me something. Um, you know, it was like, you know, maybe it's time uh, that I graduate from high school and join the real world. Uh, <clears throat> not the real world, the TV show, but, you know, uh, you know, it's time to fly, which is what I did. And I left in um, July of 1986. And you and went to, um, you know, Entertainment Tonight and all that stuff. Now, you mentioned the creation of MTV's news department. There was a time and place, and it was towards the end of your tenure at MTV and well into the 1990s where MTV would do news updates about music every hour, have the news show about music weekly. They would still have music-oriented programming throughout the day, and they would have VJs doing shifts of programming where they introduced music videos and things of that nature. And intermersed, there would be TV shows like Beavis and Butthead, The Tom Green Show, the early reality shows like The Real World and The Road Rules, and slowly but surely, it seemed like the reality shows and the scripted programming took over the music programming, and maybe even the reality program took over the scripted programming as well. What is your thoughts on present-day MTV product 2013 as we head into 2014? <clears throat> well, um, I, I, I'm not a fan of reality TV, no matter what channel it's on. I just think it's, I, I really just don't like it. First of all, it's not real, and I think it, it it's just, I, I feel stupider when I watch them, <laughs> you know. So I don't. I'd rather read a book, which I do. Um, so I'm not a fan at all of the direction that MTV decided to go. Um you know, I think there could have been a happy medium struck, uh, like you said, maybe in the 90s. I don't think that, you know, the original programming of 24-hour videos would work. Uh, obviously, you know, things change. But at least keep um, a segment. And, and I didn't watch MTV that much because I was so busy after I left. But I was aware in the 90s of the type of stuff that they were doing with Rock the Vote and, uh, you know, the behind the music and all that kind of stuff. That was VH1. But, you know, it was credible stuff. And I think they should have stayed more in that vein. Um, you know, now you have this pregnant teen stuff. God knows what else. I, I really never watch the channel. The only time maybe I will tune in um, is for the VMAs. Maybe, maybe not. It's not like... I don't put it on my list of required viewing, <laughs> but I just, you know, things change, but I, it doesn't mean that I have to like it. You know, I, I'm sorry. I'm disappointed in the fact that they dropped the whole music thread. That's why it started for crying out loud. <laughs> Now, I remember when MTV was building up to big events, a la the VMAs and even uh, celebrating their own birthday, I believe their 20 or 21st anniversary as a network, they would recollect and they would interview you and a lot of the first wave of MTV VJs in a somewhat nostalgic manner, talking about where they were in relation to where they had come at that point. How does present-day MTV as a company treat you and the other original VJs, or is there any relationship at all? Oh no! I, 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 there's nobody even there from from when we were there. Um, you know, Pittman has gone on. Uh, you know, he's he and John Sykes are uh, big radio executives. So so no. And I, and to be quite honest, I, I I don't want anything to do with them. I really don't. They, there is nothing there that appeals to me at all, other than the fact that. We were part of the beginning, but it is such a different uh, animal um, and so really against anything that I even care about. I mean, really, I feel much more associated with the Discovery Channel than I do with present-day present MTV. So I don't really want to have anything to do with them. Um, you know, I really don't. There's, uh, You know, I don't like it. Plain and simple, you know? And I, I guess they make money, otherwise they wouldn't do it. But, you know, unless they changed back to a music-credible uh, network, 
um, why would I why would I want to be associated with that stuff? Once again, we're chatting with Nina Blackwood, who, along with Mark Goodman, Alan Hunter, and Martha Quinn, wrote the book VJ, The Unplugged Adventures of MTV's First Wave. What is your relationship with the remaining present day, uh, the remaining original MTV VJs who are still with us? Uh, well, we, you know, we all work together. We're all on uh, Sirius XM Channel 8. Uh, but I call us one big, happy, dysfunctional family. We are <laughs> brothers and sisters. We always will be. Um, I thought we were close even prior to the book, but doing the book, um, each of us found out stuff about each other that we thought that we knew we didn't, you know. Um, and uh, just very, we're, we're there for each other. Uh, there's never a week. It, I think at the most there might be a day or two that goes by that we're not emailing and jumping in, you know, uh, to each other, you know, talking to each other via email. And, um, you know, we're just a very, very close uh, bunch of people. We really are. And and we truly, truly love each other. We only have a few minutes left, but is there any salacious story in the book about one of your colleagues that you had not known previously until you read this book? Is there anything that jumps out at you in that regard? Um, Salacious? Well, well not yeah, so actually, just so. actually, I was not aware of, um, you know, Alan Hunter talks a lot about, um, you know, partying, doing coke with David Lee Roth and all this stuff. And I mean, I knew Alan and his wife. I never, ever saw him do coke, ever. You know, I didn't think he did drugs. Yeah, we all, you know, would go out and have some drinks and, you know, in clubs, normal stuff. But... So I think that probably was the most, um, it was like, really? Where was I? You know, <laughs> I didn't, I never saw, never, never you saw were, him do you a, were offended a, a drug. That, you were offended that David Lee Roth never offered you Coke, huh? What? Were you offended that David Lee Roth never offered oh, you God, Coke? Oh, God, no. I, I, I don't like Coke. I think it's a vile drug. I, I really do. Nice. I think it's it's one of the worst drugs ever. I said that facetiously. I agree with you. That is oh. <laughs> original. <laughs> I M- thought you were serious. No, I was not serious. If David Lee Roth offered me coke, I would feel honored that a rock star of his stature would offer me coke, but I would respectfully decline. Is that is that fair? Yeah. No. No. He never. He never. That, I wasn't in in you know the position that he would do that when when I interviewed him it was you know we're on the set and it was professional and whatever so you know i wasn't partying with david lee roth well that's mtv vj original mtv vj nina blackwood joining us here on am 1460 the new wxbr the book is a vj the unplugged adventures of mtv's first wave a new york times bestseller congratulations on that nina and folks can also catch you on sirius satellite radio current day correct yep sirius xm channel eight nina any final words for our listeners before i let you go this morning uh, no, just, you know, thanks thanks for people that, you know, still continue to follow our careers. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a wonderful feeling uh, to know that, that people still care about us and watch MTV and, you know, just happy holidays to everybody, basically. Well, thank you so much. That is Nina Blackwood joining us here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. We'll step aside for a quick news update courtesy of Mike Pava. Stick with us here on the Metro South Morning Show, PM in the AM.